What are prokaryotes? In this video, we're going to take a basic view of the prokaryotic cell. First, let's begin by looking at the phylogenetic tree, or the tree of life. Here you will see all living organisms fall within three branches, or what we refer to as domains. There's the bacteria domain in blue, the archaea domain in red, and the eukarya domain in brown. Prokaryotes belong to the first two domains of bacteria and archaea. Those prokaryotes in the archaea domain live in extreme environments and are billions of years old. The domain of bacteria contains the prokaryotes in which you are most familiar, such as E. coli, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and more. And that will be the focus of this video. So what are prokaryotes? Prokaryotes are ambiguous, meaning that they are going to be found everywhere. They're going to be found in large numbers and in even those places in which other organisms can't live. Prokaryotes are tiny. On average, they're about 10 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes are cellular in nature. And although they may seem simple in structure, they're actually quite complex. Looking at the structure of the prokaryotic cell, you will probably see that it is missing organelles. There is no nucleus or any other membrane-bound structures that you would see in a eukaryotic type cell. So let's look at the individual structures and their functions of the prokaryotic cell. When we do this, we're going to divide it into three groups, the appendages, the external structures, and the internal structures. Let's start with the appendages. There are two main appendages in the prokaryotic cell. First is the flagella. The flagella is used for motility, to move the bacteria around in its environment. Bacteria will vary in the number of flagella and the location of their flagellum. However, in all bacteria, the flagella are going to be protein in nature and they will move in a circular motion, clockwise and counterclockwise, in order to propel the cell. The second appendage is what we refer to as a pili, or pilus for singular. There are two main types of pili. The one that's shown on this bacterial structure is the fimbriae. In that case, these protein structures are numerous around the cell, and they're going to be used to help the cell adhere to other cells or to structural environments. There's also a conjugation pili in which those bacterium will only form a few conjugation pili to connect to bacteria and where those bacteria can then exchange a specific piece of DNA referred to as a plasmid. Let's look a little bit on the external structures. The external structures will start with the outermost, which is the glycocalyx, and work toward the innermost structure of the plasma or cell membrane. The glycocalyx is also referred to as the sugar coat because it is comprised of polysaccharides. The glycocalyx can be used for many things within a bacteria. It can help prevent phagocytosis, it can help the bacteria to maintain or to adhere to nutrients, to prevent it from drying out. It can help with many things that help it for survival in virulence. What its exact functions will be will be dependent upon the type of structure. There are two looks or forms for the glycocalyx. In this particular picture, the glycocalyx is firmly attached to the underlying cell and it has a defined shape and therefore we refer to it as a capsule. However, in some bacteria, the glycocalyx does not have a distinct shape and it is loosely attached to the underlying bacterium and we refer to that as a slime layer. In some bacteria, there is a fourth layer, not shown here on this model, but it would fall in between the red and the yellow, and it's called an outer membrane. The outer membrane is found exclusively in gram-negative type bacterium. It is a phospholipid bilayer that has unique structures for the gram-negative bacterium. The next structure is the cell wall. 
A majority of bacteria have the cell wall and it's shown here in yellow. The cell wall helps with two main features for the bacterium. It helps the bacterium maintain a shape and it helps prevent the bacterium from lysing when it should get into an environment in which it's unfamiliar. The cell wall is also a defining characteristic for bacterium, meaning that we can use it clinically based upon its structure and the composition to help identify the bacteria. We'll talk just a little bit more about the typical bacterial cell wall in the next slide. Let's move on then to the plasma or the cell membrane shown here in green. This is a traditional cell membrane, meaning that it's going to be a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, etc. And it is going to regulate what enters and leaves the cell. Now, back to the cell wall for just a moment. This is generally an area in which students have difficulty understanding the composition. Therefore, there is a separate video describing bacterial cell walls, and I will refer you to the video. However, there is, for most bacteria, going to be composed of what is referred to as peptidoglycan. And the thickness of the peptidoglycan helps us to identify two main groups of bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative. Gram-positive bacteria will, will have multiple layers of peptidoglycan sheets, and so therefore their cell wall will be very thick gram-negative bacteria have only one or two layers of peptidoglycan and therefore they will have a thin cell wall. So let's move to the internal structures. Again notice there are no organelles or membrane-bound structures here but we do have several structures that we need to talk about. The first being the largest one that you see here, and that is the actual DNA, which is going to be circular in nature. And it is going to be compressed and it is going to be found in a general area within the cell. And that area or location is referred to as the nucleoid. There are also other pieces of DNA. They're going to be small circular pieces of DNA only containing a very few number of genes. Ten or less is the general rule. Those genes are going to be non-essential for growth, survival of the cell. Instead, they will be used to help with virulence. Oftentimes, they're associated with um, antibiotic resistance the production of a toxin, etc. And this is the structure in which that conjugation pillars will then use to transfer from one bacterial cell to the other. Bacterium do have ribosomes, just like eukaryotic cells, and the function of the ribosome is the same for protein synthesis. The only difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes are their sizes. The bacterial ribosome has two subunits, one is seven, uh, excuse me, 30S and 50S, and the overall unit is 70. Bacteria cells often also has something referred to as inclusions. Inclusions are just going to be areas in which certain nutrients or products are stored or supplied within the cell. And not shown in this picture, but a couple of species of bacteria, in particular the genus the Bacillus and Clostridium, will form endospores. And endospores are a survival method for certain bacteria when they get into environments in which all of a sudden it makes it difficult to live. So we've been through all of the bacterial structures and their functions. Now we need to, as a recap, go through and define which of those structures are found on all bacteria and which ones you will see on most or a few. To begin with, all bacterial cells will have the following structures. All are going to have that cell or plasma membrane. All bacteria must have cytoplasm and ribosomes. Bacteria are going to have the cytoskeletal structures and DNA. One thing to point out about the DNA is that although it's circular and coiled, it does not use histones such as eukaryotic cells do. And again, to point out, no bacterial cell will contain organelles or those membrane-bound structures. Most bacteria will possess 
a cell wall. And the majority of those that you will see will have a cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. Again, there is a separate video talking about the cell wall structure, giving specifics, and I will refer you to that video. Most bacteria will also have the sugar coat or the glycocalyx as either a capsule or as a slime layer. Some bacteria, but not all, will have the flagella or the pili. The gram-negative only will have the outer membrane. Some bacteria will have plasmids or inclusions, and the clostridium and the bacillus genus will have endospores. So with that, let's talk just a moment about bacterial shapes. There are three basic bacterial shapes. The bacillus, meaning that it's a rod shape, coccus, meaning that it is round or sphered, and a spirillium shape, which means that the bacteria is going to have a twist or be spiral in shape. For the bacillus, the rod shape, it's often going to be found to be either single or double, or it can be in a chain, which we refer to as streptobacillus. The cocci, or the coccus, which is the round one, will have a large number of arrangements. It too can be either single, it can have a double, referred to as the diplo cocci. It can even be in a cluster, referred to as staphylococcus, or as a chain in streptococcus. Sometimes it will be found in a cube, Sarsini, or even just as four as a tetrad. With this, we will conclude our video on prokaryotic cells.